Why do we remember some things and forget others? The answer to that has huge implications for anybody who delivers presentations or wants to share their ideas effectively, and that's why we need an expert like Sharon Ranganath. He is a professor of psychology and neuroscience at UC Davis, and importantly, the author of Why We Remember. I figured you'd be a good source, Sharon, and I'm glad I remembered the interview for today. I'm glad you did too, and I'm glad I remembered <laughs> because I'm uh, pretty forgetful. Do I need? Can I ask you about the guitars because it's obvious? Uh, yeah, this is my other life is that I play guitar, I write songs, and and I'm in a band, and yeah, it's kind of one of these things where you like when you can. It's nice to have more than one guitar because different guitars write different songs. So, okay, so next time for our conversation, since you and I don't live too far from each other in Northern California, I want to visit you, and you can <laughs> play for me. That would be great. Awesome. Uh, according to some estimates in your book, you say that the average American is exposed to 34 gigabytes of information a day, the equivalent of 11.8 hours of information in the form of images, words, sounds, books, TV, social media, of course, and others. I'm surprised, Sharon, that we learn anything, that we can retain anything in this three-pound brain of ours. That's just, true. I mean, uh, most of what we encounter is actually going to be forgotten. So this expectation that we're supposed to remember everything just doesn't pan out in real life. You mentioned something that I've heard before. We're not our brains are not made for retaining information. What are they made for? Well, it's made for retaining some information. So I wouldn't say it's not made for retaining any. I would say that it's it's not made for retaining everything that we experience. And so the information that our brain tends to prioritize are the things that will be most useful to understand the present and to pull up uh, information and plans, anticipate the future. But we do we do forget most of what we encounter day to day. That's right. That's right. And I think everyone can relate to both the everyday experience of forgetting or even when we remember events, we don't remember them in their entirety. We usually remember bits and pieces, which is why if you're trying to explain the plot of a two hour movie that you saw, you might do it in about five minutes as opposed to taking two hours to recite every line from the movie. Well, as you can see, when I was going through your book, which I tagged uh, quite a quite a number of instances that relate to what I do, which is a communication coach, always working with CEOs or executives um, on it, helping them improve how they create and construct information and deliver it in a way that is ultimately memorable. And there are so many tips and tactics in your book, in addition to the, the, the deep science of how the brain works. Can I get to a few of them? Yes, absolutely. Make it chunky. You start by saying that in 1956, uh, George Miller wrote a famous paper, and his original thesis is that we can only keep about seven digits or units of information in short-term memory. But since then, we've learned even seven is too much. It's more like three or four. Uh, can you explain what the implication of that is and what that means in terms of chunking information? Yes. Yeah, so... The brain, if you look at it from any way you want, whether you look at perception, whether you look at language, whether you look at memory, uh, it's designed to exploit the principle of less is more. That is to grab smaller pieces of information and extract as much meaning from them as possible. So uh, this estimate of three goes along with the idea that there's only so much information we can hold in mind because our brains really are optimized to do the most with a smaller amount of information. So the good thing is that this limit of three is not a three things in our world. It's not three numbers, it's three letters, but it's really three chunks of information, which means anything that we can say is a unit of meaning is going to be a chunk, right? So we can hold on to a string of letters that could be like, you know, let's say four letters or something like that. But we can also treat that as one word, and then that's one chunk, right? 
and a word can be chunked in a sentence even. And so, so it really depends on just how much meaning you put into processing information that allows you to reduce what you need to keep track of. I like to recommend that, well, talking about this rule of three, what I like to recommend is uh, sticking to maybe three or four features of a new product. Let's say you're having a new product launch here in Silicon Valley, where I live. Stick to three features, not 28 features. And then obviously I'll get some pushback and people will say, oh, but there's so much more. I understand but chunking doesn't mean you're only going to talk about those three things, but maybe chunk them into three categories. Uh, would that be along the lines of chunking information in more digestible bites? Absolutely. And I might even say, you know, three take home messages or three, you know, concepts, um, because essentially whatever those concepts are, you can always give people more detail, but you want to call back to those three concepts so that everything is that you give is linked to one concept or another. And, and there's actually a bunch of benefits to that. One is there's only so much that people have to keep in mind at a given time. But also every time you call back, that locks in a particular detail into a concept that you're already holding on to. And so the more you can group and clump these different points, these different details into some larger concept, the easier it is to pull up the details too. I always tell my students, it's like, if you watch an academic talk and you can extract two points even from that talk or three points, that if it was three points that they extract from a talk, that's a huge success story, in my opinion, for the speaker. I like the idea of summarizing it at the end as well. Yes. Yeah, Again, that's right. Reinforce in long-term memory. The other tip that you have, I think it's a whole chapter, is on telling stories. We forget mundane experiences. According to you, we forget mundane experiences and we remember emotionally intense ones. So stories are emotionally intense. Why? And why are stories rather than just text or bullet points or facts and numbers so much more uh, have the ability to imprint themselves on our brain? Well, stories are linked to our, the way we naturally learn. Um, we have a lot of pre-existing knowledge, like anybody who grows up in a particular culture has knowledge of particular kinds of events that happen in this culture, right? So, you know, you have knowledge of weddings, you have knowledge of birthday parties, you have knowledge about like going to restaurant for dinner. And so all of these stories are already in your head. And so if I'm communicating some message and I lay it on top of some schema, which is what we call it in memory research, if you have a schema for an event and you lay new bits of information on top of those schemas, it's very easy because you've already got 90% of the memory in there and you're just tacking on a little bit of detail. It reduces the amount of information that you have to carry. It locks it all into one big picture theme. And then as you pointed out, yeah, especially in particular kinds of stories, there's people involved, there's causes, there's effects, and that captures us in a more, you know, grabs our interest. It makes us curious. And curiosity is another big driver of memory that we've studied in my lab. Uh, excellent. Yes, uh, curiosity, which is why I recommend that if you tell a story, have a surprise, have something novel, um, peak a person's curiosity, because as you know, there could be a good story and a bad story. Uh, and so a good story has a few of those classic elements of story. You're recommending not only surprise, but uh, piquing that curiosity, leaving people curious to learn more. I guess yeah. you could even start a presentation with part of the story and then pique their curiosity so that the, they'll get the end of the story maybe later in the presentation. They have to wait for it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's exactly what you want to do is you want to get people chasing the information rather than feeding it to them. The other part of it, too, is that actually there's research showing that if you ask people a question and you try to get people to answer it when they don't know the answer, so before they know the answer, when you give them the answer, they will retain that information better. So there's just a whole lot of benefits to giving people the question highlighting the gap between what they don't know and what they'd like to know. 
and then prompting them to try to figure it out before you give it to them? Well, I think you answer in your book uh, a question about why storytelling is so ingrained in our brain, and it's uh, such a useful tool for helping people remember information. You say humans are social animals, and our brains were undeniably shaped by evolutionary pressures to communicate and cooperate with those around us. Some scientists even argue that our capacity for language evolved primarily for the purpose of communicating memories to one another. So this whole idea of communicating memories to one another, I simply call stories or storytelling. Yeah, that's how we communicate memories to each other is through our storytelling. And what's beautiful about that is once I tell you a story about my experience, it's now our memory. We share that memory, which is, I think, one of the fascinating things about the way memory works is telling a story actually changes your understanding of that story. Sharon, what I think people forget is they open the PowerPoint and suddenly they're no longer storytellers. They open a PowerPoint and they start adding text and bullet points. And what I try to re get them to recall or remember is that you're a storyteller first. Let's tell stories first, and then we can use PowerPoint to complement the stories. I think once PowerPoint was invented, for some reason, we forgot that we're storytelling animals. Yeah, I think that we tend to put a lot of visuals uh, into stories, but we don't really think about what will make those stories memorable. I, I think the bigger issue, and I think you really nailed it with the way that you talk to CEOs about this, is that we, we need to start off with the fact that people will only be influenced by what they remember, not what they see in your talk. And so you always have to ask yourself, what is going to be the memorable parts of this? And sometimes we give people too much information at the expense of things that are memorable. That's a good point, uh, which also reinforces this idea of thinking through the story ahead of time developing and building out the real memorable parts because nobody is going to remember slide number 32 out of a hundred slide deck. Uh, th think ahead of time. What are those memorable moments that I want people to take away? And then you can develop maybe a story or uh, an animation or something even more emotionally intense around it. Emotional intensity. That gets us to a, another tip that I learned in your book. Very important. Applies to any presentation, add multi-sensory elements to a presentation, pictures, videos, animations. I'll let you speak to this, though. Tell us a little bit more about what you mean by multi-sensory and, and why that's important for memory retention. Well, our memories for particular events or particular messages are tied to a context, a place and time. And so the things that give us a sense of being in a place and time are the feelings, the sights, the sounds, the smell. So, for instance, we've all had the experience of smelling something, and it brings you back to some time in your life or, you know, being in a particular place, and all of a sudden that transports you back in time. Or, or the one that happens for me a lot, as you can see, is listening to music. And there's certain yeah. phases in life where I've listened to certain songs, and a song can just bring me back. And those are powerful cues because I think, number one, people tend to have a lot of emotional attachment to particular times in their lives. And so if you can give people a multi-sensory cue that locks into a context, that's great. But even otherwise, imagery, like if you give people, you say something to people or you communicate a message that gets them imagining being there as opposed to just hearing it dispassionately, gives you so much more to lock in on in memory so that later on, you're seeing something or you're smelling something or you're hearing something and it reminds you of this message. Okay, I'm, this brings up a point. I'm not, look, I'm not an archaeologist. I'm, I'm, not a, uh, I'm not a neuroscientist like you, <laughs> but I have a theory. Okay. What we like seeing visual uh, images on PowerPoint slides much more so than we are engaged or enjoy what, reading bullet points and text. Does that go back to the fact that we were drawing paintings on cave walls long before we became had the capacity for language? Are we just more of a visual species than we are a text on PowerPoint species? 
Well, humans are a very visual species compared to, say, rats or something like that. But we're also very, you know, we do have language and we do tend to process things linguistically. And so I think that the power of pictures is they actually, there is a visual language. So, for instance, if I see a picture of somebody who's like pouring cereal into a bowl, just looking at that picture, I can tell a whole story in my head about what this person is going to do, which is he's going to pour milk into the cereal bowl right afterwards. Mm -hmm. I know his goal, which is he wants to eat breakfast. And so I can lay out an entire prediction of the next, you know, 10 minutes of this person's life based on this one picture. So it's it's a bit like the picture tells pictures worth a thousand words, but it's actually different than that because a picture can tell a single memorable story. So you would recommend that a good presentation has a combination of text, animations, and pictures. Or it could just be spoken words with emotion and pictures and no text. You know, it doesn't have to have the text on the slide unless there's key points that you really want to reinforce. But I would say that, you know, again, less is more because people can only attend to a limited amount of information. And I think that having uh, um, vi visuals captures people's attention. It gives them a different cue in addition to the meaning that you want to convey. Um, it can convey some context that's emotional sometimes. And just having something like a cute animal or a person, people can lock into that. So for, for a lot of reasons, I would say definitely include that. Movies, I've started to incorporate movies in my research and talks. And I find it's like dramatic how much people lock into videos. Can you give us just an example? What What do you mean by movies? Uh, I I, I understand, I think, you know, in general what you mean, because I use a lot of multimedia in my in my talks. Uh, but from your perspective, maybe even to a class, what do you mean by incorporating movies? I think that well, most people need an example, especially mm -hmm. something tangible. Yeah. At least in my experience, when we talk about these type of uh, concepts. Yeah, yeah. No, exactly. It's uh, um, so in my work, sometimes I'll convey some kind of a research topic. And rather than just saying, you know, so people uh, often are blind to changes that happen in their environment. So people literally don't see everything that's in front of them. So as an example, I show the scene from Pretty Woman that has a continuity really error, meaning that there's like an edit in a scene where something changes completely and nobody detects this. Right. Yeah. And so the movie gets people engaged. And then there's a surprise element that I then, you know, I ask them the question, has anything changed? Did you notice anything? And then I highlight it. And that demonstration is much more powerful than actually just hearing me talk about it. Charon, thank you. And thank you. Thanks for giving us a lot to remember, but giving us the tips to do it effectively. Why we remember. Excellent. And congratulations on the success of your book. Thanks very much. I'm just glad to pass on the message to so many people.